guests, our speaker, Scott Kaufman is the legislative director for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, California's leading taxpayer organization. I've worked with them in the past, and yes, they are very, very good. One of the one of the top, if not the top in the nation for helping state taxpayers protect themselves at both the state and the local levels. He previously served as the Education and Workforce Development Task Force Director at the American Legislative Exchange Council and opinion editor for the Southern California News Group, which includes the Orange County Register, the LA Daily News, the Riverside Press Enterprise, and eight other newspapers. Scott is a fifth generation Californian and baseball purist. He thinks there should be a constitutional amendment banning the designated hitter. I will be adding some links in comment that you may be interested in. Uh, Scott, uh, Scott's presentation, PowerPoint presentation, will be put on our website uh, shortly. And as always, our meetings are recording and they also will be available on our website. Scott, over to you. Well, thank you. And hello, everybody. I'm gonna pull up my screen share here because I have a PowerPoint for you. And uh, so basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to tell you about all of the ballot initiatives that are either eligible for the ballot or qualified for the ballot. Not all of these are tax related. I'm not going to go into detail about the ones that are not tax related because that's not my area of expertise. If you have questions about those, I'm not the guy you want to ask, but I did want to make you aware of everything currently that you could see on your primary and general election ballot. So again, I'm Scott Kaufman. I'm the legislative director for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And here are the initiatives. So what's going on? So we have seven initiatives that are currently paying at the attorney general's office. That means they're waiting for their title and summary for, from the AG before they can go out and collect signatures. We have 27 initiatives that are cleared to collect signatures. Most of those will not qualify. They will not get enough signatures. You need about half a million for a statute and a little under a million for a constitutional amendment. Initiatives that are eligible for the ballot, these are initiatives that could be on the ballot but are not technically on the ballot yet. They won't be on the ballot until the 131st day before the November election. So you can go on your calendar and count that back. But basically that gives people time to decide if they want to pull the initiative, uh, the, the way it works now, the legislature gets time to negotiate with you to possibly put a replacement initiative on the ballot if they have issues that actually did happen with one of the referendum that I'll talk about. Um, and then finally, there's the qualified statewide ballot measures. There are five of them. These will be on the ballot. These are already these are already qualified. They're already on the ballot. You will see them. So let's get into it. So March 5th, the pr primary election, we only have one initiative on the ballot, and that is Proposition 1. Proposition 1 is Gavin Newsom's mental health bond. So it really has two major components. It changes the Mental Health Services Act that was passed by voters in, in 2004. It, it reallocates the funding and, where, and the focus and, and a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of mental health groups that are very upset about this part of the bill. Where I'm not a mental health expert, I can't tell you if this is a good or bad thing. All I know is that there is a a wide coalition of mental health advocates and taxpayer groups that are going to oppose this, and uh, the mental health groups are opposing it for this first part, and groups like ours, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association, are opposing it for this second part here. It approves a $6.4 billion bond, and it would build mental health, it would go to mental health drug treatments, but it would also go to housing. It's, I'm sure, you know, livable California, you all know that the, the amount of money that goes to homeless housing for what we get is ridiculously low. <laughs> um, and this is just another example. We, we, but we generally, you know, once again, we're not mental health experts. We don't know. Maybe this is the right solution. Our issue though, is the bond. Bonds are a very costly way of funding government. After interest and bond, you know, the bondholders get paid and all those sorts of things, you've typically doubled the cost of the bond. So really, you're not looking at a $6.4 billion bond. You're really looking at a $12 billion bond or more, depending on inflation and interest rates and financing and fees and all that kind of stuff. And it's typically paid over 30 years. So people that aren't even alive yet, potentially, will have to, be pay, will have to pay for this bond. 
And so we, we just think it's a really poor way of doing it. You know, they had a $300 billion surplus. They should have done this when they had that chance, but they don't anymore. They, they spent all the money. Now we're, now we're in a deficit. We're in a $58 billion budget deficit. And so now they need more of your money. So that's where we're at. If you want to look at the, if you want to look at proposition one, you can, it's on the LAO's website. Also, if you want to look at the bigger picture, Portions of Prop 1 come out of AB 531 from last year and SB 326 from last year. So there's only parts of those two bills that are actually Proposition 1. But if you want to look at the whole kit and caboodle, see what it's all about, you can look at those two. Up next is the things that are qualified for the November 5th bond. The first two, I'm not going to go into much detail. I have all the information here that I'm really going to provide for you because they're not taxpayer related. But the first one, probably interesting to you all, you probably already are aware of it, SCA2, that's for public housing projects. Currently, the California Constitution preve prevents the, the, the uh, hold on, it's my, my screen, it's in, you, 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 all your beautiful faces are in the way of my screen, so I can't read my own notes. Uh, the Cal so the California Constitution currently prohibits development, construction, or acquisition of low rent housing projects without a, vote, a majority vote of the qualified electorate of a city, town, or county this would get rid of that. So I'm sure it's probably of concern for you all. Give it a look. That's really all I'm going to talk about. I'm not an expert on these sorts of things. I just want to let you know because it's going to be on the ballot. Next up is ACA 5. This is marriage equality. You all probably remember Proposition 8. Proposition 8 a number of years ago defined marriage in the state constitution as between a man and a woman. The Supreme Court in Ogerfell said that's unconstitutional, but it remains in the constitution. So despite the fact that it cannot be enforced, it's unconstitutional, Defining marriage as a man and a woman is still in the state constitution. This bill would remove that language. It would also add in some language about the fundamental right to marry and those sorts of things. So again, I'm not going into more detail than that, but it's going to be on the ballot. So I thought I'd let you know. These last two, though, I am going to go into more detail. ACA 1 and ACA 13. So we'll start with ACA 1. So ACA 1 amends the California Constitution, sections 1 and 4 of Article 13A. It's convenient. Prop 13 is Article 13A. It's very easy to remember. So this amends Proposition 13. They told us on the floor of the, the Senate and the Assembly that this in no way changes Prop 13, except that it amends Prop 13. You probably know the key component of Prop 13. It's the 1% of purchase price versus two uh, with the 2% cap a year, right? So when you buy a house in California... Your property taxes are set at 1% of purchase price, market value. It's really market value, but we presume it to be the purchase price. And then it can't go up more than 2% a year. Before that, it was a percentage of market rate every single year. It was about 2.6%. I'm currently fighting with someone on Twitter, so I just did the math for myself to tell you what that would mean. I bought my house in 2022, and I am already saving with Prop, thanks to Prop 13. I would be pay I'm currently paying something like $7,000 in property taxes a year without Prop 13. And this is from me owning a house since 2022. I'd be paying $15,700 in property taxes here without Prop 13. So even in your first year of owning a home, you'd be paying more than double without Proposition 13. That's the part everyone knows. The other part is that Howard Jarvis was concerned that if he just put the cap on property taxes, that they would just raise other taxes. They'd go around it. They'd find ways to raise taxes and fees and all those kind of sorts of things. So he put a two-thirds vote requirement for special taxes into Prop 13. Now, if it's, the definition is special taxes versus general taxes. That's important because there's, there's a difference here. General taxes are funds that go into the general fund. Those typically, well, almost always, are just a simple majority vote. So if it's going into the general fund for general use. It's still a simple majority vote no matter what. Prop 13 didn't change that. What Prop 13 changed is it made a two-thirds for special taxes. Special taxes are taxes that are earmarked, allocated for special purposes. His concern there was that they were going to kind of just nickel and dime you for services. You know, oh, the, you know, the, poli the police don't have enough money. Well, we're not going to get out of the general fund. We're just going to raise a special tax, and you're going to have to pay for, the, for police funding and all those sorts of things. That was his concern, that they were going to start earmarking stuff and make you kind of pay it in like a service fee in lieu of your property taxes rather than just have it in the general fund where it can, where it can be allocated by your city council. And if you don't like the way they're allocating it, you can just get rid of them. You can't do that with a special tax. Once the special tax is in, it can't be removed by anything but a vote of the people. Also, special taxes are typically paid by property owners in the forms of parcel taxes or property-related fees and assessments. 
So while everyone gets to vote for them, property owners typically only pay them. So the logic was that if you want to do a special tax, you, it's not enough just to get a majority of the voters. You need to get a majority of the people who are actually going to pay it to and a two thirds vote hopefully gets you that number. What ACA one does is it lowers that two thirds threshold and it lowers it for infrastructure. And I air quote infrastructure because it's a laundry list of things that it actually that are qualified as infrastructure in the bill. In fact, a Democratic state senator, a Democratic state senator who actually ended up voting for the bill on the floor of the Senate described the 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 allocation of projects as incredibly broad. So that tells you that even they thought it was broad. And there's even and then there's, of course, a, a catch all line in there that says. Um, but not limited to, you know, so it can be even more than that, right? It's 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 for these things, but not limited to. And also, uh, and then also affordable housing related projects. It's going to lower that two thirds to fifty five percent. And so, what happens when that happens? What what what's the outcome? Well, we know because we have Proposition thirty thirty nine. You may remember Proposition thirty nine from two thousand. It lowered the vote needed to pass special bonds, uh, pass local bonds for schools to fifty five percent. The result: four out of every five pass. And nearly 80% of all two-thirds supermajority measures get 55%. So we did the math with the last election of how many of those bonds would have qualified had it been at this lower threshold. And it and you would be paying $255 million more in taxes today had the 55% threshold been in effect for these projects at the previous election. I think once the 50... Although... I think that's a low number. I think that's the floor of how high it can get. Once they know that they can get these things passed at 55%, you're going to see the numbers, the dollar amounts increase exponentially. They're already talking about, because of ACA1, they're already floating a 10 to $20 billion housing and infrastructure bond in the Bay Area. And I think all bets will be off ACA1 passes. And ACA1 also has this fun little line in it that says, if ACA1 passes, any measure on the same ballot as ACA1 that would have needed a supermajority but now only needs 55% passes if it gets 55%. So a lot of these things could sneak up on you real quick. So be on the watch for those. Up next, we have ACA13. ACA13 is a little bit more complicated. It's sneaky. So what it does is it really thwarts an initiative that we work to put on the ballot, the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. We worked with the Business Roundtable and other business groups to get this, this measure on the ballot. And I'll talk more about exactly what that measure does um, in a couple of minutes. But ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, it closes, a, it closes a number of loopholes that have been created by the legislature and the courts in Prop 13. We're trying to close those. They don't want us to close those. They like these, these roundabout ways to get around Prop 13 and raise your taxes. They don't want us to pass that. So what they did is they did this ACA 13. What ACA 13 says is if you want to pass a constitutional amendment and you want to raise a voter threshold in your constitutional amendment, you have to pass that constitutional amendment by the same threshold. So why is this important? Because one of the things the Taxpayer Protection Act does is it restores the two-thirds vote requirement for special taxes. I told you Prop 13 put a two-thirds vote required in for special taxes. Well, a couple of years ago, there was a court case called Upland v. Cannabis Coalition. And it was and it was really about whether or not this cannabis group, marijuana, had qualified an initiative to legalize marijuana you know, uh, sales in the city of Upland. And there was a debate over whether or not they qualified for a special election or a general election. And somehow in this court case, what came out of this court case was an undoing of the two-thirds vote requirement in Prop thir Proposition 13 as we know it. The courts decided that a citizen initiative, a citizen's initiative can go around the two-thirds vote and just needs a simple majority to qualify a special tax. And so we've seen tremendous abuse of this. It's funny, the, the League of California Cities actually agreed with us initially that the court was wrong to take this position, that, that the, that the two thirds vote only, only uh, applies to government entities. At first they agreed with us. They said, there's no, there's no way the constitution could, could say this. Once they figured out how to use it to their benefit, 
then they change their mind and now they like it. What we've seen is that city councils, county governments are now really colluding with citizen groups, special interest groups, to put special taxes on the ballot at fit, at a simple majority, not even 55%, a simple majority. And it's really causing a problem. You're seeing a lot of taxes and they're passing and it's really uh, it's really a concern for us. And so we want to close that. We, we want to put it back the way it was. We think the voters intended when they passed Prop 13, the special taxes would be two, a two-thirds vote. So we're trying to put it back. And I should also mention, this is a two-thirds vote for local taxes. This is not a two-thirds for state taxes. It's a local tax. So it's you need to get two-thirds in the city of Upland. You need to get two-thirds in Modoc County. Two-thirds of, of that electorate is 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 large. It's a large number, but it's not insurmountable, right? You you can you can knock on doors in Upland. You can knock on doors in Modoc or Kern or even LA, right? It's 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 a doable feat. They want us now to have to pass a two thirds get this passed by two thirds statewide. The California electorate we need to get two thirds of them to support this initiative. That is quite the task. It's nothing like this has ever been happening happened before there's never been a requirement for two-thirds vote in the state constitution except for bonds which they're trying to lower with aca1 they're trying to lower the two-thirds vote requirement for bonds which has exist exists in the constitution since the 1870s we don't care they don't care it's really concerning to us we think it would make it would make it almost impossible to pass taxpayer protections like this going forward it's a real concern for us so here are the other measures that are eligible for the 2024 statewide ballot. One of these I'm going to talk about in detail. One of them is our initiative. See if you can spot it with the attorney general's uh, quite deceptive title and summary. But um, here they are. So the first one is it's an income tax hike um, on incomes over $5 million by 0.75% for 10 years for pandemic detection and prevention. This was actually put on the ballot uh, by Sam Binkman, Binkman Freed. You probably remember him. He's the guy that's going to jail for the cryptocurrency stuff. He bankrolled this, so I don't know if we'll actually see this on the ballot. They don't have any money, and I don't know if they're going to get any more. But it's technically qualified, so it could be on your ballot. This next one is about the Private Attorney General's Act, PAGA, if, if you've heard of that. It allows individuals to sue on behalf of the state for uh, for employer you know, on behalf of themselves or other employees against an employer to recover monetary penalties for certain state labor law violations. It's really kind of opened the floodgates on litigation for these sorts of things. The attorneys and businesses want to close it. So there's, there's an initiative to, to stop that. Th this one right here, though, limits ability of voters in state and local governments to raise revenue for government services, constitutional amendment. Wow, doesn't that sound like a fair and balanced title and summary? That's our initiative. That's the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. I'll go more into detail, but just the top line is for new and new or increased state taxes currently enacted by two-thirds vote, the legislature would also have to go to the statewide voters. Think the gas tax. They passed the gas tax without voting the people. They wouldn't be allowed to do that again under this initiative. Uh, it also expands the definition of taxes. We've seen we've seen a, them kind of push their taxing authority off on regulatory bodies and then the regulatory bodies issue fees and those sorts of things, which are really taxes, but they call them fees. So they don't have to be voted on because they're fees. So we're expanding the definition of tax to cover those sorts of things. So you do get an opportunity to vote on them. This other one would just raise the minimum wage. Uh, the minimum wage already is increasing, but this would increase it to $18 per hour. And then this last one is repealing cost of Hawkins to allow for statewide rent control. So those, those are the other initiatives that could appear on the ballot in 2024. They're not on the ballot yet, but they could be. So here we go. The Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. So I tried to be fair and balanced. I, I want to be, obviously I'm biased, I'm opinionated, you've been getting my opinions, but I want to be as neutral and fair and balanced as possible. These are not these are not my top lines. These are actually the LAO. This is from the LAO. 
This isn't the entirety of the LAOS report. I had to cut it down to make it fit. There's a link down at the bottom if you want to read the whole report. But this is their top lines. So this is their nonpartisan language that tells you what the Taxpayer Protection for Government and Kill Accountability Act does. So it expands the definition of a tax. We've already talked about that. Uh, rather than take a tax to the voters, a lot of local governments, the state, have really kind of pushed off their taxing authority to regulatory bodies that then issue, do rulemaking and issue fees and those kind of things. This would redefine those things as taxes that require a vote of the people. So they can't get around, they can't get around the, the, the right to vote on taxes by calling it a fee. This other one would require voter approval for state taxes. Already talked about this, but I'll just mention it again. Currently, the ledge, they need a two-thirds vote in both houses of the legislature. That really isn't an impediment anymore because the, the Democrats control a supermajority. If they want a tax to pass, it's going to pass. So now we're, now we're thinking we should really have the voters have a say in this because they frankly don't have a say in the Capitol right now. If, if the powers that be want a tax, there's a tax. So we think the voters should be allowed to vote on it as well. It would also add new requirements for approving local taxes. It would, uh, you know, this is this is the one that would, um, I think this is it. Let me make sure here. They use they use terms I don't know, but it, but basically, this is the one that would make it a two thirds for both. It would put it back the way it was to Prop 13's intent that special taxes require a two thirds. They currently don't. If it's a citizens initiative, this would make it so that they all they're all special taxes. Again, general taxes do not require a, a two thirds vote. It's a simple majority. They have a way to raise money. They do. They raise a lot of money through through general taxes, and in fact, they raise a lot of money through special taxes. Special taxes now. Pass depending on the type of special tax, they pass between 48 to 51 percent of the time. So they're getting their special tax passed almost half the time every time. Currently, with the two thirds, they're 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 bringing in enough, despite what they tell you. They always need more, but we think they have enough of your money. So this one, this is a new thing that would that requires them to state the the type on the ballot. They have to tell you what kind of tax it is, whether it's a general tax or a special tax. They have to tell you the amount that you're going to pay or the rate and how long you're going to pay it. That's one of these. That's a new rule. So they'd have to tell you what kind of tax you're voting on, how much you're going to pay, how long you're going to pay it. They currently don't have to do that. A lot of them have been doing it, but we're making it so they have to tell you those sorts of things. This is uh, this is. This would put more fees into the realm of things that you can vote on. This next one requires the legislation and local government bodies to impose state and local fees. Fees would have to be imposed by a majority vote of both houses of the legislature or local government bodies. This is, again, they passed a lot of this off to regulatory bodies who have rulemaking authority that don't necessarily have to have a, don't even really have to necessarily have a vote. And they can just kind of issue fees and those sorts of things. This would make it so someone has to vote on it. If you're not voting on it, your your local city government is voting on the fee or the, or the state legislature is voting to impose this fee. Someone's going to have to vote to raise fees in, under this measure, either a vote of the people or your local city government, county government, or the state legislature. And this last one is that fees cannot exceed actual costs. Because this is, this is a game they've been playing for a long time. That's actually why Prop 218 came about. In the 90s, Proposition 13 passed. They started just creating these special, these assessment districts to get around Proposition 13. And they were really just using it as a money-making venture to recover the costs or to recover the, the cost savings, your cost savings from Prop 13 and, and getting around the cost savings you have for Prop 13 and your property taxes by doing fees that didn't weren't really associated with the cost of service. So Prop 218 came around. It says... The cost of you have to charge the fee has to be equal to the cost of service, right? It's not a money making venture. What they're charging you to provide this service is what it actually costs to provide this service. There's some ways they've been getting around that. This is just kind of again clarifying that it has to be the reasonable cost to provide the service. That's what they're charging you the reasonable cost to provide the service. So maybe you disagree with me. But this all sounds pretty good to me. This is this. It either allows you to vote on taxes, it cre increases transparency about taxes. You know, there's just a lot of transparency, accountability, rights to vote on taxes, more clarity on the ballot arguments, all those kind of things. 
I'm biased, but it sounds good to me. I like this. Who could be opposed to this? Well, the state government. In fact, everybody in government is opposed to this. The, the, the counties, the cities, the, the state, they don't like it, and they're suing us. They're suing the proponents of this ballot initiative to keep it off the ballot. It's legislature v. Weber. That's Shirley Weber. She's the secretary of state. They're suing her in her capacity as the secretary of state, but really they're suing us. They're suing us. They're suing the business roundtable. They're, su they're suing the proponents of this measure. Le the legislature and Gavin Newsom himself are suing us, and they claim this, con this measure is a constitutional revision. So a revision that you're, you're, you're effectively trying to redo the Constitution without redoing the Constitution. You're, you're like throwing the old Constitution out and doing a new one, but you're not, you're not having a con – you're supposed to have a constitutional convention to do that. So it would be like – a constitutional revision would be like, let's say I put a measure forward that just completely strips out all of the language of the current constitution and puts in new language. And I put that up to a vote of the people. That would be a revision, right? I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to rewrite the, the, constitu the California constitution without going to a constitutional convention. That would be a revision. They're saying this is a revision. The, the, giving you the right to vote on more taxes, allowing for more transparency on the taxes you already vote on, that's a revision of the Constitution. It would also impair essential government functions. That's what they're claiming. To this, I say, that's if that's true, that's not a problem with TPA. That's a problem with, your, with the legislature and the governor and the city councils and the county's credibility. Because if they, can't, if they can't get the money they need out of the voter, then there's something wrong there, right? The voter does not trust them to spend their money. And if this would... If they could not get a tax passed because the electorate doesn't believe that they would spend it wisely, that's not TPA's problem. That's their problem. They have a credibility problem that, that should not prevent the voter from having more rights when it comes to taxes and how they vote on taxes and the information they have in their ballot. Where are we at on this? Well, the Secretary of State and, and us, we have to respond by December 27th to this, to this court case. They have to, Gavin Newsom and the legislature have to respond by January 17th. Amicus briefs are due by January 31st. And replies to those amicus briefs aren't, aren't required until February 14th. So oral arguments scheduled perhaps in their, when, the legis, when the Supreme Court is in session in March, maybe April, maybe early May, or late May. Who knows? They say they'll have a decision by June 27th, though, because that's the deadline for putting stuff on the ballot for November. They claim they'll have a decision earlier than that, but that's that's their self-imposed deadline. So we don't know when there's going to be a hearing yet, but there will be a hearing, and we'll see how it goes. We think we think on the merits we win, but as, as a lot of you know in California, the merits often don't matter. It's the politics at play, so we'll see how it goes. For my next slide, it's just quickly the last two things that could appear on the ballot. Well, they're, they're on the ballot, but they could get pulled off, and one of them already has been pulled off. These are just the two referendums. So if the legislature passes a bill and people don't like the bill and they want to take the bill to the vote of the people, they want to ask the voters if, you, if they like this idea, they can collect signatures and they can put a referendum on the ballot. The first one was this overhaul. It, it created a, a workers council for fast food workers, a government appointed workers council for fast food workers that would set wages and benefits and all kinds of stuff. The, fr the fast food companies and the franchisees obviously did not like that. They put a, a measure, a referendum on the ballot. They made a deal though, in the last session, they, they did the fast food recovery act, uh, AB two five seven. They made a deal. So it's looking like the fast food referendum will not be on the ballot. I haven't seen that it's officially been pulled yet, but it looks like they made a deal. They're going to likely withdraw the referendum. This other one is a referendum challenging a 2022 law prohibiting new oil and gas wells in your home, schools, and hospitals. It's more than that. It's effectively a ban on drilling within within any urban setting, any anywhere. <laughs> it, it's almost it's really almost a ban on. Dr oil drilling in California because it, it's you know the, the attorney general says it's near home schools and hospitals but it's it's a residence it's a school it's a hospital it's any business open to the public it's 
all it's parks it's all kinds of things more than 3000 feet away you can't you can't do it that's pretty much everywhere except you may be out in the middle of absolutely nowhere so it's really kind of a ban on oil drilling that's what the oil companies see it as a ban on oil drilling in california they collected signatures to put it on the ballot I don't. I, I think this one's probably going to be on the ballot. I don't know what kind of deal the legislature can strike with them. This seems to be a fundamental disagreement on this on this issue. So I think you'll likely see it on the ballot. And then after that is my shameless plug for something that could be on the ballot. This is an initiative we're working on. It's called we call it repeal the death tax. They call it initiative twenty three dash zero 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 five. Uh, our title and summary was issued on August 21st, 2023, and we need 874,641 valid signatures by January 16th. We want them by January 16th. We really have to get them to them by early February, but we want them back to us by January 16th because there's work that goes into it behind the scenes after we receive the petition back from you. But what does this do? So you may remember Proposition 19 from 2020. What Proposition 19 did, well, it did three things. It allowed you, if you were over 55, severely disabled, or the victim of a natural disaster like a wildfire, you could move and take your Prop 13 with you. You could already do that, but you could only do it one time. It had to be a house of equal or lesser value, or really kind of a downsizing measure. That was kind of the idea behind it. And you could only go to a county that accepted the transfer. A lot of Southern California counties did accept the transfer. A lot of Northern California counties didn't accept the transfer. So you were really kind of limited where you, where you could go. Prop 19 said you can do it three times. You can take it to a house of, of, of greater value, although I think there is a value calculation in there. So if you're thinking about doing it, talk to your realtor first because you may still get reassessed on some of it if it's over a certain dollar amount. And the counties have to accept the transfer. So we think that's a good thing. We like that. We like, we like that old, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the premise of Prop 13 was that older folks on fixed income should be run out of their homes. And so if you want to move and take your Prop 13 with you, we think that's fine. For, for older folks to do. We think that's absolutely fine. I think if your house burned down and you don't want to re and you don't want to move back to where your house burned down because you can't get insurance or whatever, we think you should be able to move and take your Prop 13 with you. We think that's fine. There was another part that didn't get a lot of talk though. And it changed the way property was inherited. Before this, there was there were there were two initiatives called Proposition 58 and 193. And they created an intergenerational transfer exclusion to reassessment from property taxes. So when you when you inherited your parent when when you inherited your parents' primary residence and up to a million dollars in assessed value, not market value, assessed value of other property, you were protected from reassessment prior. You got the, the primary residence, the family home of any value, whether or not you moved in, it was yours. You got to keep the prop 13 base year value on it. You also got to keep up to a million dollars in assessed, again, assessed, not market value property, which could be rental properties, it could be a small business that you that you own in your name could be a vacation home, could be whatever. You got to keep it without triggering a reassessment. Prop 19 changed that. Prop 19 now says you can only keep the family home if you move into it within a year, you claim it as your primary residence, and it has a value calculation. So that the, the value of the home can't be more than your base year, your Prop 13 value plus a million dollars. And so this is proving really difficult for people because you know people like me, I can't, sell off all of my belongings and move back back home in a year i don't that's not where my job is and i i can't i can't do that right so so that that's that's an issue a lot of people can't move back um and then also this value calculation you know base year plus a million dollars you're not you're potentially not talking a whole lot here you know you may be covered up to 1.1 1.2 million and if you live in the bay area anywhere on the coast in california los angeles very modest homes are going for more than that. I actually, when when I when people call us to get a petition mailed out to them, I you know I look up their house to make sure I've got the address right, and you know Zillow pops up when I see these people's houses, and you get these eighteen hundred square foot two bedroom one and a half baths for one point three million in the San Fernando Valley in L.A., and these people are going to get taxed out of them. So, so we're fixing that. We're going to put it back the way it was. We're going to put it back to Prop fifty eight and one ninety three. That's our goal. We're collecting signatures. We need a little over 800,000 valid signatures, like I said, but people make mistakes. They fill it out at the wrong address, whatever. We're looking to get more than a million just to make sure we cover, just to make sure we have this statistical, this enough statistically to qualify. We're looking for a million or more.
So I'm going to go right here to just, this is again, the BOE did this, by the way, if you have a lot of questions about Prop 19, I have to say, go to the BOE's website, boe.ca.gov. There's actually a, a link at the, at the very top about Prop 19. If you want more information, they've got a lot of great information on it. If you need more information, this actually came from them. I use it in all my presentations just because I think it's really helpful to really kind of outline the big changes. So right here at the very top, you have Proposition 58193, right? Principal residence of transfer, no value limit, resident and homes this land may be excluded as other property. Proposition 19, principal residence of transfer and transfer E value, current taxable value has been adjusted and only for family homes and farms. Other real property under Prop 58, you got $1 million assessed value under Prop 19. None of it. It's gone. If you have rentals, vacation homes, you own a business property in your name, it's getting reassessed. This is only the family residence, and it's only if your kid moves in within a year, claims as their primary residence, and it's worth less than that current taxable value plus your base year. And I have to say, they can never move out. If they move out, it gets reassessed to market value, and it gets reassessed back to your date of death, which is insane. So if, if, you're, if your kid follows all the rules, moves in within a year, claims as their primary residence, it's under the value cap, they get it, it's not reassessed, and... 15, 20 years later, they decide that they want to move closer to their grandkids or something. That property is getting reassessed. <laughs> it's getting reassessed market value and it's getting reassessed back to the date of death. So all of those years that they lived in it and followed the rules don't matter. They're getting reassessed if they move out. The only way it doesn't get reassessed is if they die in it and their kids inherit it and the cycle starts again. That's really all it is. It's, it's just an insane way of doing it. You know, it, they could have done this so much better and they didn't. It's it's a mess. It's poorly written. The assessor sent a letter to the BO saying that they wanted 18 pages of fixes to Prop 19 before they could even implement it. They've barely gotten any of them. It's still a mess. It's still complicated. We get calls every day from people saying, well, what about me? What about this? You're likely going to get reassessed. Trusts do not protect you from this. That's a lot of things. People think that trusts protect them from Proposition 19. They do not. The assessor has a copy of your trust. You file it with the county. They have, they have a copy of death certificates. They know when the beneficiary interest changes, that is a change of ownership. You will get reassessed. Maybe not right away, but they will eventually figure it out. You, you put a patio cover on and you pull a permit and they look into that and they go, wait a minute, this, this changed, this changed hands. You're going to get, you're going to get a reassessment and you're going to get a reassessment back to the date of death. So, you know, you may think you're, you're you're skirting the tax man by by not telling them and keeping it in your trust for five, six, seven years. But year eight, they find out you're going to be paying taxes for those eight years. They want their money. And, and I will tell you, the assessors really don't like Prop 19. They don't like being the bad guy in all of this. They don't like having to send you the, sorry about, sorry about your mom dying. Here's your 268% uh, reassessment. Have a great day. They don't like doing that. They're elected. They're not fans of it. But they are, they are forced by the Constitution. This is in the state Constitution. They are forced to uphold it. So they have to do it, even if they don't like it. And then here's just a couple of things that I've kind of already gone over, uh, kind of frequently asked questions. Um, so there's, there's the value calculation. It, like I said, it's complicated, but that's the value calculation to figure out even if you move in, are you going to get reassessed or not? There's the quick value calculation. This is on the BOE's website. It's under frequently asked questions. So you can read it there too. Um, this is, this is the, what happens if I move out, it's getting reassessed. What about if I move in, I check all the boxes and I want to move out later. It's getting reassessed. And then this last one, what if it's held in a trust doesn't protect you and that, and there, and if you don't take my word for it, here's the BOE telling, and the BOE has more of these frequently asked questions. So if these aren't one of your top three questions, the BOE has them. I can also answer, hopefully your question, if you have questions. And, uh, and that's where we're at. So if you'd like to change this, put it back the way it was, you can help us by going to repealthedeathtax.com. Repealthedeathtax.com. You can download the petition. We tried to do this a couple of years ago. We had one of those big old long petitions that you see in front of you know Walmart when you're at Walmart or those sorts of things. We didn't get enough signatures. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, how can we redo this in a way that gets it in more people's hands? And the way we came up with was we really went back to the drawing board. We really rewrote the initiative. It's now five paragraphs. 
five paragraphs and it fits on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with two signature lines. So husband and wife can sign it, mail it. They can print it out on their home printer. Husband and wife can sign it. You can fold it up, put it in a regular letter sized envelope, one stamp. You can mail it back to us. You can make as many copies as you want. You can make professional copies. You can, you know, you can download a petition. You can get an updated top funders page. There's a new law in California that we're required to show you a top funders page and we're required to show it, we're required to update it every single month. The Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and our uh, very kind donors are the ones that are paying for this. So we are the only people funding it. We're, we're getting small donations. It's a lot of small donations. No big money is coming into this. They don't care about it. rich people. Rich people can pay the property tax or they have expensive lawyers that can get around it. It's really only normal folks like you that are getting hurt by this. So as a result, that's who's donating. Normal people are seeing you know, donations of 20 bucks, 50 bucks, those sorts of things. But thanks to them, we are able to do whatever we can to try and get this on the ballot. Like I said, it's, it's us. It's the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and, and, and our members. The Howard, Jarvis, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association is a membership organization. We, we charge $15 a year. And with that, you get all the great benefits of being a member, like having me come talk to your group. But, uh, but yeah, if you'd like to help us with this, repealthedeathtax.com. You can download the petition. You can also calculate your tax bill. You can find out how much your kids are going to pay. It will be a doozy. I, I, think, I think I mentioned, and maybe I didn't, but I think I mentioned my, my, my Twitter spat where I bought a house in 2022. With Prop 13, I'm paying $7,000 a year in property tax. Without Prop, 5, or without Prop 13, I would be paying $15,700 a year in property tax. And that's just, that's me who's only owned a house for what, three years, two years. Um, so imagine what it would be for these long held family properties. Imagine how much it, it would increase. It would be unaffordable. And that's the issue that we're seeing. People just can't pay these property taxes. I, I had a guy call me. He lives in Alameda, parents' house. It's, you know, it was almond groves when, when his parents bought it. And now it's Silicon Valley. It's very desirable. And he said, if I move in, I'm going to be paying $15,000 a year in property taxes. If I don't move in, I'm going to be paying $24,000 in property taxes. I cannot afford it either way. I'm a normal person with a normal job. And we're hearing that everywhere across the state. It's a problem. We hope you can help us collect enough signatures to put it back the way it was. Repealthedeathtax.com. And I'm done. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I see, I see 51 chat bubbles. I'm going to stop my screen share. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Uh, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, the main point that people have been trying to push is we need to get rid of this limitation on raising taxes because there's such a huge need and it's so difficult to raise taxes. Well, I did a little survey. I'm a CPA and a world-class anal retentive, but I repeat myself. Prop 13 was supposed to limit property taxes to 1% unless there was a two-thirds vote with some limitations now. I checked my last bill and I'm now paying 1.52%. So it's over 50% higher than the 1%. And that was because the hoops were jumped through and, and the taxes were raised. Sales tax in California when Prop 13 was passed was 6% for the state and almost nothing for the locals. The state has gone up to 7.25 and now the weighted average when you have all of the city, county and special district sales taxes, it's now over 9%, an increase again of over 50%. Here's the good news. The state income tax, the highest bracket was 11% in 78. That has only gone up to 12.3%. So that's the smallest increase. Uh, the Bay Bridge in 78, the toll was 75 cents. And most of the other bridges in the Bay Area were less than that. Uh, it's now for all bridges. $7 going up to $8 very shortly. And since 2000, when Prop 39 allowed the 55% passage for school construction bonds, 
$198.7 billion of school construction bonds have been passed. Okay, so we're happy to take any questions. Please raise your hand. If you can't raise your hand, uh, chat or something. Anybody have any questions? Okay, I will now be singing favorites. Uh, who has a request? Okay, Jenny, please unmute yourself and you're off. Uh, thank you, Scott. It's really, really great to hear people like you. Come Jenny, you just muted yourself. Oh, you're, I will be next. Stuck and my thumb you. over. Okay, my I can't control my tablet. I'm really glad to hear people like this coming on because our new city council in Cupertino, right after they got elected to the majority, the Yindi, they they kicked out our legislative review committee and canned it. So I'm really glad that you guys are here talking about real politics. Um, I was just going to say that um, I was wondering if they had found that that you all had Bonta and the governor and the AG when you came to try to get your title and summary, were they very aggressive or abusive toward your um, things that you were trying to get filed? Because it, there has been a reputation that, that they are very abusive toward people trying to get things on the ballot. Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes. They were very, uh, we, the title and summaries are not kind to things that they do not like do not like either of our initiatives so the titles and summaries are not great yes there there is there is an effort to potentially remove the title and summary power from the attorney general and give it to the lao uh that's a con i think that's a conversation worth having because I, I do think the lao you know, the lao prides itself on being nonpartisan and neutral and I, and I think they do a good job you know i i will read i will read the lao's analysis of our stuff and i'll go yeah that's fair like there's things I don't like about it, you know, because obviously I'm I'm biased to one side, but they, they I think they give both sides very fairly, and um, and the AG, you know, it's yeah, and as as someone in the class said, it can be partisan for both sides. Yeah, you have an elect, you have you have it's true. Although I don't think we'll see a Republican in the AG's office for quite some time, uh, but yeah, it's it's true. I mean, it's 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 a it's a partisan office. It's an elected office. It's there is a D or an R next to the person's name. And as a result, you get partisan, uh, partisans title and summaries. Uh, obviously I think they don't like our initiative. So you see, you see that in the, in the summaries and they like, and they like other initiatives and you see that in the summaries and it's a problem, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a problem. I, I think we should really look at the LAO. Uh, what is the LA? Over. What is the LAO? The legislative analyst office. Okay. They're like they're like the congressional budget office. They they're they're the they they calculate how much things cost and those sorts of things. But they're they're the congressional budget office for the legislature. But they're they're nonpartisan. Um. And and I and you know you can say you know a lot of places say they're nonpartisan. Yeah. Right. I, I they pride themselves on being nonpartisan, and I think they do a pretty good job. Thank you very much. Julie, you're up. Please unmute. And why don't you tell them who you represent? Keep Scott, those questions coming in, folks. More hands. Scott, really appreciate your presentation. Uh, a lot to absorb, a lot that I needed to know. I'm a um, city council member uh, in Pleasanton. Mm -hmm. And so much that I of your presentation, but I was going to mention that Senator Niello was um, ha, has been trying to push um, SB 858, which transfers the the title and summary to the legislative um, office uh, analysis office. Um, this group, many of us support our neighborhood voices and our neighborhood voices. I know we've tried to work with. Um, you guys in in a lot of this because you guys have been so successful in getting your um, initiatives and um, constitutional amendments and very grateful for the work that you do. Um, but the our neighborhood voices, we had originally a good title and summary that came out of um, Bonta's office, but this most recent 
recent one is a very as exactly what you just said that um, it's been set against us to set, to create um, it. The messaging makes it nearly impossible that we could get a fair shot at getting it passed. So we have been talking to Senator Niello about his. And while we know it's um, not a, um, a bill that's likely to pass in our current um, legislative, it's still an important discussion to have what you said. Could you help us understand there are multiple ways of getting on the ballot. There's the citizens initiative and then, but our legislators, they don't have to um, collect that million signatures. They can vote to put something on the ballot. And um, with our neighborhood voices, we've tried doing both paths because the Citizens Initiative, as you've made clear, is so difficult to do, so Herculean and expensive. And we've been struggling with it and not been successful. So I was gonna ask you to explain that. Um, and then I had one more quick question, if if I can come back to that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, why don't you answer your first question and then come back to Julie? Okay. Yeah, so I guess there are multiple ways, as you said, there is the collecting signatures route for a statute. It's about half a million, I think, something like that. Um, signatures, and to get a constitutional amendment, it's a little under a million. It's 871,000 and some change. Obviously, on both of those, people are going to make mistakes. So those numbers aren't the real numbers. You're going to want more than that because, you know, people have to people have to sign that address they're registered at and kind of all these other rules. And if they don't, that, that's invalid. So you want more signatures than are necessary to make sure you qualify. Because typically what's going to happen with a citizen initiative is you're going to collect the signatures. If you have enough, you're going to box those signatures up and you're going to send them back to the county that they were signed in. So like if... You know, the these the people signed the people live in LA, they're registered to vote in LA. You're gonna put all those box, you're gonna put those back in a box to LA and you're gonna send it to the registrar of voters in LA. You're gonna send them back to San Francisco, you're gonna send them to, back to all 58 counties that they were received from because that's where these counts are going to occur. The LA County Registrar of Voters is the one that checks their voter rolls to see if these people are registered to vote in LA. So it's it's a it's a it's a monumental effort potentially, right? But People are going to make mistakes. Like I said, they're not, they're not going to sign the right place. You, you want you want to make sure you have enough. The, uh, the first check, they do a random kind of sample the first time. They pull names at random. And they say, statistically speaking, they have a 70% validity rate. They have enough to qualify. If you don't hit that number, then they're going to do a full count. And they're going to look count every single signature. That obviously takes a long time. It can delay it. It can, it can potentially prevent you from going on the ballot the, the next election. You know, that's what happened to the Taxpayer Protection Act that I was talking about. It was supposed to be on the ballot last time around, and it took so long to get the, collect the signatures and to count the signatures that it got pushed to 2024. So that can happen, too. So you also want to make sure you're aware of the deadlines and how what's the deadline for the short count, what's the deadline for the long count, and make sure, you, make sure you, you're going to be good in those time frames if you do need to go to the long count for whatever reason. Yeah, you mentioned the other way of doing it is going to the legislature. The legislature can legislate, le legislatively refer initiatives. They've referred five this year. I went over them. ACA 1, ACA 13, ACA 5, ACA 2, SCA 2, uh, you know, the, the Proposition 1, which is the mental health bond. Those are all from the legislature. Uh, someone did ask who was the author of ACA 1 real quick. I see it in the comments. Ag uh, Cecilia Aguilar-Curry, <laughs> by the way. Um, just to answer, just trying to answer as many questions as I can, but you can do it that way. You know, I don't think, I mean, the, the neighborhood voices initiative is trying to undo, you know, like SB nine and 10, which the legislature put into place. So I don't think that's the route you're going to be successful in. I think the only way you're going to do it is through a citizen initiative. Someone did comment in the comments. I think it was a private comment to me, but I'll say it in case other people are thinking this. They said, how, how are you doing an online petition? They told us our neighborhood voices had to be on paper. Ours is on paper too. We just managed to fit it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper so you can download it, print it out, sign it. Needs a wet signature, blue or black ink, fold it up, put it back in the letter size envelope, mail it to us. So that's how we're doing it online. We're not really doing it online. It's just making it easier for people to ex make it more accessible to people, which is kind of our goal. We're running citizen initiatives are incredibly expensive in this state. You know, 
the the TPA that we talked about, the Taxpayer Protection Act, we worked with the business community on. We got that qualified because the business community has money. And they put up something like $16 million just to pay the signature gatherers to get it on the ballot. That's how much that cost. So, so regular groups like us that don't have $16 million to drop on a citizen's campaign, it's incredibly hard to qualify an initiative in the state of California. So much for citizen democracy, right? So we're trying to reinvent the wheel here with this petition. We're hoping that not only can we get this thing passed because we think it's important to get passed, but we're hoping it kind of becomes a, uh, a proof of concept for a one-page initiative that you can that a citizen group like ours, like a small, a small, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association is mighty but small. A, a group like ours can actually qualify things for the ballot that the voters can vote on. That's what we're trying to do. Um, okay. We hope it makes uh, it easier. Yeah. Sorry if I'm rambling. Uh, one more question from you. And please lower your hand. Amy, you'll be next and you can unmute. Okay, so um, I I find it amazing you identify Howard Jarvis as a small, but we're, because our neighborhood voices, we're tiny in comparison and you guys are so powerful and, and we see you guys as the big dog and we're the, the puppy. But there's um, only 12 of us. We have, we, have, we have a staff of 12. So. Wow. Wow. Okay, good work. I really do Thank appreciate you. it. So, um, so much of what you just said, but I'm not going to take the time. Um, although I do, we will pass on to our neighborhood voices what you're doing with the one pager, because um, I think our group has a huge concern that that would leave open too much vulnerability to error. And what you said about the vulnerability of an error, uh, how it will crumble the house of cards. So, but um as an elected official, local lo elected official, um, I'm very opposed to piling on more taxes. So I'm really very grateful. Um, I, I saw someone, I think Margaret, um, supporting the money for schools. I, you know, with my kids going through, I saw so much abuse of money that I don't think that there's money well spent there either. We want our kids and our schools to be healthy, but man, I just have a real problem putting money into the hands of people who I don't think are trustworthy. Locally, my city council, myself, I struggle so hard to be fiscally responsible, but it's such a struggle. What So much of what you just said. Um, with Prop 13, I support it. So grateful that it exists. It has allowed uh, my mother and others to stay in their home where they would have been forced out. And um, so, so grateful for the work that's been done and continue to be done to try, but the constant erosion and trying to get um, parcel taxes and bonds. And there's so much pressure put on me, um, us as electeds, because um, trying to find the funding to um, do the infrastructure that we know our cities need and deserve. We've got huge problems with water infrastructure right now. We've with PFOS and toxic water issues and how to find that balance. And I feel under so much pressure with the discussions we're having where my city staff is saying, you know, we need to find alternative funding sources. And so, you know, I, I, I'm certainly more generous now with um, electeds understanding and being in that position to try and figure out that balance where I, I, I don't want to put money, um, I, I st still see irresponsible spending and I'm constantly fighting it, even with good people, good people, but things sometimes aren't done the way they should be done. And so it's, it's a constant struggle. And my last piece that is so concerning to this group and to many of us, um, the legislature is, and by the way, we did do, um, we got some friendly legislators to try and put the equivalent of ONV through the legislature. And we did, a, it, you know, we knew it couldn't get through because of what you said. We knew that, but it was a messaging thing to send it through and try and bring some attention to what all of us are feeling, all of us in this group and another group that I'm involved in. Um, but it, it, it is just so um, the legislature right now is trying to this their goal for this 2024 session is to eliminate um, 
mitigation fees, housing and, and building li- mitigation fees. And I, in a position that I'm in, eliminate- Can you speed it up, please? I know. Uh, but t- when those fees are eliminated, you know, we we won't have the, the funds for, and those fees were replacing some of the funding source that- Prop 13 had eliminated. And so the pressure that's being put on us to float more bonds and more parcel taxes locally is enormous. I mean, we're always getting proposals to teach us how to pass these bonds. And, you know, I do not support changing the voting thresholds. Anyway, thank you for the work that you're doing, but it's it's a tough balance. It really is. Well, I guess I would say to that, you know, a lot of people describe the Howard Gardner Taxpayer Association as an anti-tax organization. I honestly think that's unfair. I, I think we're a you have to you have to tell the voters why they should pass the tax, right? We we think we think the voters should be involved in the process. That's that's really what it is, you know. And if the and like I said, general general uh, general taxes pass at like 70, 80 percent. So I mean general taxes pass all the time. And special taxes pass about half the time, between 48 and 51 percent. I think city special taxes pass about 51 percent of the time. And that's by the League of California City's own data. That's them saying that. So, I mean, taxes, I mean, so there is revenue and the voters are willing to pay for it if they believe you. You know, I, I often tell the story of, you know, you, you bring a friend, you bring a friend from, a, from another state, and you're, you're driving them from the airport and you go, you know, it. It would be one thing to say, yeah, I pay a lot of taxes, but the roads are great and there's no homeless people and all those sorts of things. But that's not true. We pay some of the highest taxes in the country, including property taxes. We, we pay one of the highest sales tax rates in the country. We pay one of the highest income tax rates in the country. We have the highest gas tax rate in the country. And even property taxes. We're in the middle of the pack. We're not the lowest in the country. We're in the middle. We're like 15th in the country in property tax all- allocations. They're getting there. There's a lot of money coming in. And and I don't and I and, and you and you know, honestly hearing you hearing you talk and the thought process you're going into, you sound like one of the good ones. It sounds like you're putting a lot of thought into this. And I, and I think if you need the money for hexavalent chrome or whatever, I mean, that's a serious issue. I think you could make that pitch to the voters and you could get something passed. And, and we wouldn't oppose it. If the voters vote for it, you get the two thirds. God bless you. You know, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Amy. You're up. Uh, yeah, then Rick, please lower your hand, Amy. Thanks. Quick question, um, Scott. Uh, you referenced the fact that we know that we need basically a million signatures to get ONV passed, but you mm-hmm. talked about five hundred thousand needed for a statute. Yes. Would that not apply to ONV or the stuff that you're doing because it's a constitutional amendment you're looking for? Is that the difference? Constitutional amendments require more. So it's it's a percentage of I think the way they calculate it it's a percentage of the number of people that voted for governor in the last election. So if you want to lower that rate, don't vote for governor. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Newsom, Newsom or whoever replaces it is going to win. Uh, so so that that lowers the number. Uh, but it's based on the number that uh, that uh, of, of people who voted in the last election. And statute the number for statutes is lower than the number for constitutional amendments. Constitutional amendments eight hundred seventy ish. Statutes is lower. It's about half a million. Statutes are different. So obviously con- the constitutional amendment, once it's in the constitution, it cannot be changed, but by another constitutional amendment. That's the difference. A statute can be changed by the legislature. A statute is just the code. You're changing the code and the code can be changed. So if you want something that's permanent and immovable, you want a constitutional amendment. But since you're doing that, you know, and it's, but to do that, there's a higher threshold. And I think that makes sense, even if it's a difficult threshold for normal folks like us to hit. I think it does make sense that the higher that the threshold for constitutional amendments is higher than statute because you know constitutional amendments are are immovable. They're 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 rock solid unless there's another vote to undo them. So it'd be worthless for us to try to do ONV as a statute. That makes no sense because it would just be overridden a month later in the legislature. Uh, More okay, than likely. Just, okay. Quick quick question. I'm you know having Having sat through a few minutes of the pain of the uh, the Fox thing uh, with Newsom and DeSantis the other night, um, how so? How is it just the difference that a state like California likes offering an awful lot of social services, uh, and a state like Florida does not care about that? I, I'm trying to understand how states can survive having not only lower taxes, but in in that case, no taxes. 
where do, where are they getting the money from to support um, a state full of people? It's not like it's a tiny and poor state. Mm -hmm. Is it all from Disney? Well, we have Disney too, and and right. I and I will and I will say that someone commented about how because of Prop Thirteen, Disney pays low taxes. That's not entirely true. You hear a lot of claims about how Disney pays a 1953 tax base. Technically, they pay a 1976 tax base to be technical. But the reality is anytime they add something, anytime they add a new parking garage or a new attraction or California Adventure, anytime they're pulling a permit, they're getting reassessed. So they're not paying, they're not paying their they're not paying a 1976 tax bill. They're paying, they're paying a lot of money. So that we are getting a lot of money from these corporations because anytime you probably experienced it, anytime you pull a permit, you get a letter from the assessor going, What'd you do? How much did that cost? Because it's going to go on your property taxes. But going back to your question of why why is Florida seemingly better run than California? Oh, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> well, okay. More fiscally responsible? Is that a better way to say it? I don't lower know. Taxes. Uh, lower taxes. Lower taxes. Lower taxes. Okay, lower taxes. Why why does Florida have lower taxes in California? I think you're right. I do think they probably spend less on services than California does. Um, that said, I haven't done a side by side comparison, so I can't tell you. But I but I do think they probably run a weaker government. Which is probably which is probably the reality. California Thanks. has a lot has a lot of dollars and a lot of things. Thank you, well, Scott. I, you're welcome. And I, and I think and I think there's a good example of this. Of uh, so, so last year, what was it? Last year, year before, we had the 300. It was two years ago, I guess. Now we had a well, it'll be two years in January. But two years ago, we had the 300 billion dollar surplus, and this year we did not have that. We we, we actually right. ran it. We ran a deficit. But we brought in more money this year than we did when we had the $300 surplus. More revenue came in than it did when we had the $300 surplus, $300 billion surplus. So what happened? They spent it. So I think, so I think maybe that's the answer to your question. They spend it as fast as they can get it mm. in. And they do a lot of this stuff where they'll spend one-time money on ongoing things. And so when the money dries up, now we don't have money to fund this. And now we need a tax to fund it. You, you, you see that a lot. And that's a problem. Fair Thank enough. you. Thank you. Rick, uh, you'll be next. And uh, then uh, Salvador. Uh, now, the link to the petition for the Stop to Death Tax is in chat. It will also be on the Livable California website. Feel free to download all you want. For God's sakes, read the instructions very carefully before you send it in. You don't want your 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 petitions to be wasted. Rick, you're up. Then Salvador. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the the threshold, the million signatures or what, or half the million mm -hmm. signatures. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sort of speak personally. You know, I'd like to see those numbers be significantly lower, uh, such that small groups even individuals could get some get uh get on the ballot and uh you know because right right now huge people with huge money can get can get on the ballot it isn't like oh they you know they you know they can get the signatures uh and uh and so it seems like what we get to vote on is pretty biased uh, by, you know, toward what very, very rich interests want. And unfortunately, so is my view. So is the legislation uh, that that we we see coming out of Sacramento. So reducing those numbers, would it be possible uh, to do a uh, to to reduce those numbers through an initiative i think those numbers are in the i would have to check this might be something i have to get back to on because i don't know the answer i don't think i know the answer to this question but my but my in the back of my head i'm thinking that these numbers are, are in the constitution so if you would need a constitutional amendment to change the numbers so Good luck, but I, I it might be in statute. I'll have to go look. But if it is a statute, they can just change it if they want. Um, but I will get back to you on that. I have your email, so I will look into this and I will get back to you on the answer to that about how to how to change. If you want to change the numbers, how you do it? Yeah, if you uh, if you uh, 
find that it's uh, potentially changeable, I would encourage the Howard Jarvis group to consider doing it, whatever it takes. Yeah, I'll look into it. I'll Thank get back you. to you. Thanks. Uh, Salvador, uh, you're up. And both of you can, uh, Rick and Salvador, if you can lower your hand. Salvador, you're still muted. And any more questions coming in, raise your hands. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Salvador Diaz. I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, Guadalajara, uh, a community, unincorporated community to Los Angeles. And uh, thank you, uh, Tom and uh, Mr. Scott for this information. It's really very important uh, that we continue uh, together and let this knowledge uh, to the people. Uh, my concern is I live in uh, South East Los Angeles and I see a lot of uh, government, local government, their abuse about taxes in our communities. There are uh, many people, they're not involved in, many people, they are resident, they don't care what's happened, but I care because uh, I'm a resident for 57 years in this community. And, and I see too many uh, people that are abused about the very low income families. Why we have to pay taxes uh, 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 more than supposed to be. We pay preposition 13. Then the local government, the uh, the mayor or the uh, board members, they added extra taxes and on our properties. That's uh, that's unfair for the community. Um, there are a, a lot of corruption. Uh, they we have it in these communities. But we try to do something. We go to Sacramento and speak to the legislature people, the assemblymen, the senators, but they don't do anything. What uh, my comment is uh, what we can do to abide this kind of fraud, uh, the contaminator and, and, uh, and corruption in our communities. Thank you very much uh, for letting me speak. And it's a pleasure to know everybody. Well, th thank you for the question. So I guess the biggest, the big question, you know, you asked, what, what do we do about the corruption in our communities? And, you know, I don't have a great answer for you on that. I mean, I think it's reality just that you just got to mobilize. It sounds like you already are, but just keep mobilizing and vote people out. If they're not, if they're not doing you right, get rid of them. Um, I will say that, you know, we're trying to help you on the tax front. You know, I, we're hoping that the, the Taxpayer Protection Act, we hope it gets on the ballot. We hope the Supreme Court doesn't throw it off the ballot. But if it does get on the ballot, I'm hoping that it will solve some of the issues you're having with the, these 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 sneaky taxes that they're they're putting on without, your, you know, without a vote of the people and kind of those sorts of things. We're hoping to do that. Um, you know, the, 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 the promise to me, the, the simple promise of Prop 13 is that the tax code should not be weaponized to run you out of your home. If you want to live in your house for 57 years, you should be allowed to live in your house 57, for 57 years. And the property taxes shouldn't get so high that you can't live there. And they're, and they're trying to find all these ways to get around Prop 13 and run you out of your home. And that's, we don't think that's right. So we're hoping that the tax, you know, we're hoping that the Taxpayer Protection Act gets on the ballot. We're hoping it passes. We're hoping that a lot of these, hit, these sneaky fees and hidden taxes and all those kind of th sorts of things that they're putting on your, on your property, we're hoping that those will have to go to the people. So you so you can have a say on whether or not you want those taxes on your on your property. We're also hoping that the you know repeal the death tax passes so that when your kids inherit your property, they don't get taxed out of it. We're gonna we're gonna keep fighting, and that's and that's what I say to you is just keep fighting. That that's that's the only shot we have. That's, you know what, what's the saying? If uh, evil wins when good people don't do don't do anything, do good. That I think that's really the answer. We have a few minutes left, uh, so if anybody else Thank has a much. question, but in the meantime, uh, I have one for you. You've mentioned the high cost of getting a ballot proposition onto the ballot. Then comes the second half, trying to promote it, advertise it, etc. Yes. So I'll ask you uh, the question in this way. For ACA 1 and 13, 
how much do you think we will see in advertising and other forms of promotion from the advocates? And how much do you think we will see for the Taxpayer Protection Act? I think you will see a lot of money uh, for and against, especially ACA 13, because ACA 13 obviously has direct implications on TPA. So I think there's going to be a lot of money spent for and against ACA 13. I don't know about ACA 1. I think you'll see a lot of money spent in favor of ACA 1. I don't know how much money you'll see against spent against ACA 1. We're going we're gonna to fight it best we can. But like I said, we're not, we, we are not a huge organization, which I guess surprises people, but we're not. Uh, we are not a huge organization, so we're going to do our best to fight ACA one. But I don't, I don't know if we'll have the institutional backing that we're going to have on ACA thirteen and uh, TPA. So, I, I think on TPA you're going to see a lot of money both ways too, um, just because that's the nature of this. I mean, you saw with the with the sports betting, they spent what eighty million dollars for and against. They spent some crazy amount of money. I'm thinking you could see that kind of money being spent on ACA 13 and TPA since they're kind of, they're, they're kind of one of the same. So I think you'll probably see them, you know, yes on ACA 13, no on TPA. Yes on TPA, no on ACA 13. I think you'll see probably campaigns like that to, to better pool the money. But I, I expect that to be very, a very heavy spend. Like I said, ACA one, I'm not sure. Cause I think there's a lot of focus on 13 and TPA. You know, if, if TPA passes, it, it might, undo ACA one. There's talk about things that directly conflict and what happens if both things pass and they conflict. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of legality around that. So there might, I don't know, but I, I expect you'll see a lot of money spent for ACA one at least, and we'll spend as much as we can against it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you told us you had until 1130 and we're coming right up to that. So I'll just ask if you have any final comments you would like to leave us with. Oh, I just, I just wanted to thank, I just thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. You know, obviously, you know, I know that folks here have differences of opinions and I just appreciate the, the good questions and the respectful dialogue. And thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much for that fine presentation. And as we told you before, we're probably going to ask you back as we get to the run up to next November and uh, see how things are going, where we will, at least know what's on the ballot at the time, not only from the state, but also from the local and regional levels. Uh, and as I've mentioned also, we will have separate meetings to discuss what's going on in local and regional levels. And that is very important because on those, most of them have not been placed on the ballot yet. So there is still time for us to try to influence. It's difficult, and I'm not going to tell you it's going to be overall greatly successful, but at least we still have the opportunity. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your fine presentation. And thank you for all the great work that the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association has done over the past several decades. I've worked with your organization several times. I wish you were 10 times the size. I know that trying to figure out which, which, question for help, which request for help to take is very difficult for you people. There's so many you'd like to do and so few, few attorneys. But there's another good place you can send money. They need it. They use it well, unlike some of our governments. Thank you. See you next time.